when, in the course of human events, one people have achieved a number of secret criteria, the laws of nature and nature's god and the Grand Jackalope entitle them to a bonus episode. So, here goes. Praise the Grand Jackalope. Oh, uh, trigger warning, I guess. There's a bit in the middle of the episode here where I get a bit salty. I've tried not to say anything that'll lose us our precious uh, clean tag, but it does mention sex, so if that's a problem, uh, see you in two weeks. Saddam's Favorite Artist, presented by number 13. They say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, and though I agree with the underlying moral, let's face it, everyone does. We judge books by their covers all the time. Odds are you don't have the time or money to read far enough into every book that interests you in order to make a qualitative judgment of its contents. So you take the easy path and get the one with the best cover. Easy peasy. No shame in that. I use the same strategy for picking wines, and it's never steered me wrong. Uh, speaking of wine, a uh, garçon, another pint of wine, please. Anyway, if you're an old-school nerd like me, a real card-carrying member of the Walden Books Otherworlds Club, you've purchased many a book based on nothing more than an eye-catching cover. Odds are that some of those books had covers by one of the true masters of the art, Rowena Marl. Born in 1944, Rowena was an army brat who moved around a lot. She went to college, but dropped out when she got her missus degree. The life of a housewife, though, was one she found tremendously unfulfilling. She tried to alleviate her boredom by taking classes at the local learning annex. One of those classes was drawing, and Rowena turned out to have a real knack for it. After her marriage disintegrated, she enrolled in the fine arts program at the University of Delaware. She graduated in 1971 and began pursuing a master's degree at Temple University's Tyler School of Arts, but did not graduate. Rowena found herself working a series of odd jobs, catalog illustrations, portrait painting, photo retouching. Then one day, she found herself in the offices of Ace Books editor Charles Volpe, who hired her to do a cover painting for a romance novel and then a few horror novels, and eventually an awful lot of fantasy and science fiction novels. I'm trying to think of the best way to quickly describe Rowena's style, and failing. Uh, the first phrase that comes to mind is van art. Y you know, the sort of fantasy scenes you'd find airbrushed on the side of a Dodge Ram with quadraphonic sound and shag carpeting in the back, but that's too reductive. To be sure, there are elements of that in her art. Nubile women who look like playboy bunnies and hunky bare-chested men with rippling abs, though since her heyday was the 1980s, the men aren't quite as chiseled as they would be today, and the women all have big hair and French-cut bikini bottoms. What makes Rowena stand out from her contemporaries isn't so much the content of her work as its style. She used thin layers of oil paint and high-gloss glazes to create satiny, seductive images. She knew how to create evocative scenes that made you eager to see what happened next, and how to lead your eye around the image with vivid colors and dramatic lighting. She could be photorealistic when she needed to be, impressionistic when she didn't, and how to balance both approaches in the same painting. And from an editorial perspective, she also knew how to make an image that could stand on its own, but still worked when over a third of it was obscured by the author's name and title in embossed metallic ink. Rowena always spoke about her work in self-deprecating terms. I was looking for a way to make a living, and it paid the rent. The paintings were high camp. I always found them hilariously funny. She shouldn't have been so humble. Fantasy art isn't exactly my jam, but even I can tell she was one of the masters. And apparently, I wasn't the only one. On Sunday, April 13th, 2003, Rowena received a telephone call from her sister, who said that her paintings were on TV. Rowena switched over to CNN, and sure enough, two of her old jobs kept popping up behind Wolf Blitzer as he nattered on. They were covers she had done in the early 1980s for books by Swords and Sandals schlockmeister Andrew J. Offutt. Technically, I think the books were written around the covers, but that's not important. The first painting, King Dragon, depicts a hungry-looking dragon swooping down on a buxom bikini-clad beauty who arches her back to receive him, looking for all the world like Jennifer Beals in Flashdance. Uh, the second, uh, Shadows Out of Hell, depicts a frantic barbarian being wrapped up and devoured by a giant serpent that dwarfs uh, his own serpent, while a cruel blonde wearing nothing more than a few feathers lounges in front of a demonic idol and feigns disinterest in the whole scene. Now, why were they on CNN? Well, because they were hanging on the wall of one of Saddam Hussein's Baghdad townhouses, which had been used by his sons Uday and Kusay as a love nest. That pleasure palace had just been seized by American troops during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. In the mid-1980s, Rowena sold several paintings to a Japanese collector for $20,000, including those two, and she hadn't thought about them since. Now she couldn't stop thinking about them, and not in a good way. I was utterly stunned. I can't say that I take anything coming from a quarter like that as a compliment. 
If, in fact, he was looking at my works and thinking anything, I'm very curious. Rowena and her sister weren't the only people who'd noticed King Dragon and Shadows Out of Hell. It turns out the problem with having a recognizable style is that, well, it's recognizable. Other media outlets noticed and identified her paintings, and what they said about them was not kind. Joshua Glenn of the Boston Globe called the works, A freaky assortment of paintings that depict ridiculously chesty blondes in string bikinis and nothing at all, being menaced by grotesque monsters, trolls, and dragons. Jonathan Jones of The Guardian said the paintings wallowed in, The hysterical aesthetic, the hyperpornography of power and violence, before asserting that Saddam is less elevated in his taste than Hitler. The BBC called her Saddam's favorite artist. To these critics, I have one thing to say. Uh, Screw you. Don't talk to me about elevated taste when the most celebrated museums in the world are more than happy to display a skull studded with a ridiculous number of Swarovski crystals for the sole purpose of driving up the sale price, a fiberglass statue of a naked anime girl that transforms into a jet fighter, and geekly prints of Jeff Koons having sex with his porn star ex-wife. Or anything by Jeff Koons for that matter. Heck, most of the academic works in the Musée d'Orsay only exist because 19th century gentlemen didn't have other ways to look at boobs on demand. One of the other paintings in the townhouse was a copy of La Grande Odalisque by jean Organiste Dominique Ingres. Is Ingres techie now? What I'm getting at is that there are plenty of reasons to hate on Saddam Hussein that don't involve mistaking your aesthetic judgments for objective reality, or slandering a hardworking artist. Also, the pictures didn't belong to Saddam, but to his son Uday. Uday was apparently a huge sci-fi fantasy dork who even outfitted his father's irregular Fedayim Saddam units in outfits patterned after Darth Vader's armor. Uday may be one of the more extreme cases, but he is a perfect example of the uncomfortable amount of overlap between science fiction fans and literal fascists. On the lighter side, you have folks like the 501st Legion, the folks who dress up like Imperial Stormtroopers at conventions. On the darker side, you've got the furries who were recently booted from Anthrocon for dressing up in Nazi and Confederate outfits. At first glance, one of these groups seems a lot more benign than the other, but you know what? Space fascists are still fascists. But number 13, you say, the 501st Legion are good guys. They work with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They're just drawn to things that look cool, and it's not their fault the villains look cooler. I agree with you. For the most part, they are just good people responding to the aesthetics of Star Wars. Thoughtlessly responding, which is the problem. That's how the Nazis get you. They make things seem simple, cool looking, maybe even a bit mythic. And then the next thing you know, you're an accessory to genocide. As is the case with many things in life, science fiction author Norman Spinrad summarized it best. In the hands of a cynical hack, these action adventure parameters can be responsible for pornography of the most obscene species. The masturbatory manipulation not of our sexual arousal, which at worst may result in compulsive onanism, but of our violent arousal, which at best results in a catharsis of suppressed rage, and at which at worst results in war. For political morality aside, this leads directly into a prevalent literary vice, the degeneration of sophisticated storytelling into a stylized plot skeleton based on escalating sine waves of tension and release, in which stirring scenes of physical combat at the peak points of the plot replace thematic and personal epiphanies as dramatic resolutions. Short of its inner spiritual heart, short of Gully Foyle's climactic mystical democracy or Paul Atreides' tormented ironic prescience, the tale could only become what Hitler made of Nietzsche. Without the moral vision of a Bester or the tragic irony of a Herbert, the inner light of the story is lost, and in place of a paradigm of spiritual maturation, we are left with only the pornography of power, with the egoistic Faustian masturbation fantasy of the fascist mystique, with the reader's hands in his tight black leather pants as he envisions himself as the all-powerful ubermensch in the ultimate catbird seat. To illustrate his point, Spinrad wrote an entire book, The Iron Dream, which is a work of fiction from an alternate timeline where Adolf Hitler abandoned politics and became a science fiction illustrator and author. It was a fascist power fantasy with Nazi overtones, and the only thing that set it aside from 90% of the books it was shelved with was that it was upfront about being a fascist power fantasy with Nazi overtones. But I digress, let's get back to Rowena. I don't think you can say she was guilty of promoting fascism, either consciously or unconsciously. I can concede that the very underpinnings of her work can be problematic, but what creative works aren't at some level? Even Ziggy cartoons are problematic. I think the best and simplest thing we can say is that Uday's love for science fiction and fantasy tells us more about him than it does about her. Now, given what I just said about simple explanations... mm. For her part, Rowena was discovering that not all publicity is good publicity. Over the next several months, she was forced into damage control mode, releasing press releases full of obvious statements like, I utterly hate Saddam Hussein. I loathe everything he is and everything he stands for. 
I remember seeing her table at the 2003 Pittsburgh Comic Con, which was dominated by a very large sign explaining that she did not know Saddam personally and had never sold him any of her paintings. She seemed stressed, like she was having a lot of sleepless nights. In the long term, well, it all kind of died down. Rowena made a brief attempt to regain ownership of her works. A subsequent investigation revealed that the original paintings were still in Japan, and the ones hanging in Saddam's townhouse were merely high-end reproductions. The Fuhrer died down, and Rowena's reputation slowly recovered. Anticlimactic, I know, but sometimes that's just how life goes. In 2006, the original King Dragon was sold at a heritage auction for $12,000. Rowena Marl passed away on February 11, 2011. As far as I know, the two reproductions are still the property of the Republic of Iraq. Key sources for this episode include The Art of Rowena by Rowena Marl, Aaron Santeso's Fascism and Science Fiction from the March 2014 issue of Science Fiction Studies, Norman Spinrad's Science Fiction in the Real World, and contemporary newspaper reports. If you would like to know more about the problematic side of science fiction, you should probably go out and read Spinrad's The Iron Dream. It's great. I might also suggest checking out Jill Lepore's podcast The Evening Rocket about the uncomfortable relationship between science fiction and modern-day techno-utopianism. We're putting final touches on Series 12 right now, so how about a quick preview? It's spooky season, so we're turning up the creep factor with two episodes about cryptozoology and one about some serious Fortiana. Don't worry, though. We still have episodes touching on weird stories from history, politics, and science, and we're wrapping up with a religious story that's appropriately Christmassy. As usual, here's a spoiler-free list of some of the sources we've used for our research. I Awaken to Glory Stranger Than Fiction Other Tongues, Other Flesh Four Famous Mysteries Hunting Monsters, Cryptozoology and the Reality Behind the Myths For Christ Will Come Tomorrow That's all for now, Initiates. We'll be back on October 17th with an episode we're calling Kings of Pain. Right now, though, I'm going to go hide from the Grand Jackalope and sleep off all this wine. So until then, quiquid minime sciant, optime scire. This episode was produced by David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope, and that's not canon productions. Our theme song is Drama D by Scott Roosh. This episode is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. All rights reserved, all wrongs reversed. The full script and sources of this episode can be found at orderthejackalope.com. That's orderthejackalope.com with hyphens between the words. Do you have thoughts about this episode? Why not head over to our Discord server and share them? There's a link in the show notes. Or reach out to us on social media. We can be found at Order Jackalope on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Reddit, and Facebook. If social media is not your thing, you can always send us an old-fashioned email at jackalope at orderthejackalope.com. We're looking for new Lodge members. We'll initiate anyone into the secret mysteries. All you have to do is share a secret mystery of your own first. Go visit our website and click join us for more information.